Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Hi guys. We have a lot of we have a lot of familiar faces on the panel. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight, and thank you so much for Metaverse Club for hosting us. Um, this night's topic is going to be all about the future of the Metaverse, and I thank our wonderful, exceptional panelists so much. We have people on very different time zones, so it's good morning for John. I think it's afternoon for uh, Pauli and Bathys, and Esco for you as well. It's morning, right? Yes. Good morning, in New York. So, Esco, I thought we had an agreement that you're going to sing for us to start the panel tonight. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Just I so everyone wanted... knows the singer. Okay, good morning. Good morning, or good morning from New York. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Uh, my name is Esco. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, inventor, and also entrepreneur. Um, I've invented a new um, consensus mechanism called uh, Proof of Reception uh, with some leading computer scientists around the world. And um, Allah, if you'll help me with this demonstration, uh, the Proof of Reception consensus is very simple. Um, you have to let me know what you want me to do, and you have to let me know what you'll give me uh, for me doing what you want me to do. And then once you receive it, and I receive what I want from you, that creates the finality of the transaction. Unlike proof of work and proof of stake, there's no third party miner or staker. So we self-validate one another. And that's the perfect uh, consensus for the metaverse because it's like the real world. So Allah, if I sing a song for you and I customize one of my original songs for you, what will you, what will you give to me in return? I will happily clap. And I think everyone's going to join me. Okay, so your your smart contract is if I customize my song for you, you will clap. So that's your NFT or what we call portion. And my portion is customizing my song. So one of my songs that's coming out soon is called Only Option. And I'll, I'll sing it for you, Allah. Make me your only option, Allah. Woo! So so you, you received my song, I received your claps. <laughs> Finality, we received each other's values and that's minted onto the immutable truth, which is the public network that you guys see today. So that's a demonstration of my song and proof of reception. And I uh, hope you guys like that little snippet and you can listen to more if you Google or look on Spotify. Thank you. That's, that was super cool. And I, and I love how you explain it in very simple terms so everyone could actually understand. Now we can do that in, at a party, right? Let's do right. proof of reception right now. Uh, but I would love for you, all of you, to, to take a bit of time to introduce yourself and, and you know, why, why you think you're here, what would you like to contribute with, but, you know, a little bit about what you do um, at your day job, or maybe it's a night job or a morning job. So I would like to, to invite uh, Pauli to go first, because, um, yes, ladies. Um, yeah, please. And then Batis and John. Thank you. Hi. Um, I might have a little lag with my camera and my communication, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, so I am a founder, sorry, co-founder, creative director, CMO, and whatever other hat I have to wear during the day. But mostly I just clean in, in the, at the company, you know? Any problems, people come to me to clean it up. That, that's, my, that's my role. Um, we are building a um, mythology franchise, uh, starting with the game. Then we also are going to do uh, immersive um, environments for people to enjoy. Because now we know with the COVID and constant lockdowns, people want to travel. They don't really have a place, hence the metaverse feeling that you can actually be somewhere else than at your home or whatever you are locked in at the moment. Um, and we also looking at um, animated series and anything that we can do to invite people to visit Azoria, which we just launched a website for, visit uh, azoria.com. And we um, had a fun um, advertising campaign in um, Nat Geo Traveler that is pretending to be a real place um, because in fact it is a real place but we yeah. actually are pretending to the Nat Geo travelers that you can actually travel there. So the next issue will be coming like uh, book your tickets, uh, you know, whatever the release of the next big thing we, we will have. So we're playing a little bit with um, 
things like um, the environment. We spend tons and tons of time to build the world. So we try to give people some of that glimpse into what they can expect when the game is out, when the books are out. And we're going to start with children's books because it's very hard for children to comprehend all these craziness in the world right now. And I think they need a little bit of a safe space. Um, yeah. And then um, I think I will finish here because I don't want to overtake this. I'm very happy to hear uh, about everyone else. So please. <laughs> no, that was great. And, and we want to definitely go to Azuria as, as, you know, as I suggested. I hope the tickets are going to be NFT tickets because I represent an NFT marketplace today called Nifty Souk. So that sounded uh, exciting there. Um, Batis, tell us a bit more. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Batis Samadian. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Space. Uh, Space is a commerce virtual world where um, uh, the creators of tomorrow are basically enabled to build their own uh, immersive commerce experiences, such as a virtual store, 3D mm -hmm. subscription room, or ticketed event. Uh, yeah, we've been working on this for about 12 months, and uh, I've been in crypto since 2013 before this. Happy to be here. Excellent. We all like shopping. Online shopping is a thing, and the virtual shopping is, is, the, is the next thing. John, what about MetaJuice? For sure. Yeah. Is it tasty? I actually, does it taste like something? How does juice taste in MetaJuice? It, it, it tastes master. great. It tastes great. It tastes great. If you, if you listen to some of this great music we're hearing this morning and, and you have a little bit of the meta juice, things are pretty good in the morning, even at 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, I work at um, two companies um, that really work together, right, um, in this mm -hmm. Web3 metaverse space. One is VU, I am VU, one of the pioneers yeah. in the metaverse space, right? Been around 18 years, right? One of the early, early players. It's actually one of the mm -hmm. largest social global metaverses right you got millions and millions of monthly active users about a million daily active users all creator led so the entire economy all the virtual outfits avatar shapes rooms nightclubs everything all run by users right 13 languages supported so a big vibrant environment then we created metajuice i'm the president though and um uh, metajuice is really bringing in view in the web 2 space into the web 3 space so we've already integrated, yeah. got, we have over a million active wallets on our platform. We've got a digital currency called Vcoin. And then we'll later be launching, um, we've already done some pre-sales and whatnot, but you'll see later a public listing offering of a token called Vcore, which is a lot like sand and mana in that space. But again, inside a very large, vibrant existing ecosystem. We're also now top, top seven in collectible NFT sales, um, just having integrated um, NFTs into our marketplace, right? So we're just making it real easy for our global user base to buy, engage, commerce. We're talking about commerce, by the way. You know, I love kind of the, the, the all the activities that happen in our metaverse are happening here on this on this um, call as well. Um, and that that's kind of what we're doing, right? Moving Web two to Web three and making it real easy and big, right, and vibrant. Yes, big, uh, vibrant, and you know. The juice tastes great and the music is fantastic in the metaverse. That's right. It all comes together. I, I, I feel something going on here, right? It I is. Know. There is a lot of stuff going on here. And I think we, <laughs> the Metaverse Club has really selected an exceptional you know, pool of talent. And I think, uh, I, I hope we can, uh, we can answer or give the audience a bit of um, intriguing answers about the future of the Metaverse. I'm sure you all have thought, you know, what, what is actually today currently with you know all the things happening on on the news and things like that what do you think is in reality what is shaping the future of the metaverse is it the people is it the technology um esco i'm sure you have something to to tell us about that yeah thank you for choosing me to um answer this question <laughs> Um, yeah. I think um, in order for us to, you know, really have uh, a good experience in the, in the metaverse, uh, we need to take a step back and look at how transactions and that are validated in the metaverse. Or, you know, if we really want decentralization, uh, we need to realize that just like, you know, you and myself are talking, we need to kind of bring that human interaction or that validation protocol uh, into the digital side of things. So I think in order for us to kind of have these native experiences in the metaverse, uh, we need to solve what's called the consensus mechanism. And, you know, since 2008, we've seen proof of work be commercialized with Bitcoin. 
with miners around the world. However, we found that uh, 90% of the mining capacity is validated by 10% of the miners. So no longer is it really decentralized in the original intention that it was supposed to be. Thereafter, we shifted to a proof of stake consensus mechanism where, where stakers, people that own tokens, ended up validating the network. And we see very early on that in the Ethereum merge and other um, upgrades that the stakers are now becoming another centralized power. Also, we also see other projects like FTX and Terra and all these things controlled by a handful of people. And that's why we kind of create the vulnerabilities and the compromises we see today. In order for us to really have a truly decentralized world, we need to be able to validate each other's values. Just like you validated my song before, I validated your clap. And just like online, you know, we don't want a third party controlling our private discussions, charging us gas fees, making us wait for their time. So I've been able to work with, you know, some leaders around the world. And because Web3, you know, has had a lot of baggage with that term now, we've created mm -hmm. a new type of um, Web3 called Web Trinity. And our mission is to really empower everyone to self-validate themselves in a native human intelligent way by allowing our technology uh, to create a self-validating wallet where the wallet not only receives value, but it's also able to confirm the counterparty's value on a distributed ledger, uh, fulfill any contract directly rather than depending on an EVM or third-party ER721 uh, mechanism we can self-validate one another like we do in the real world. And once we have that type of consensus mechanism rolled out in the metaverse, I think it'll be more native, it'll be more affordable, and uh, we'll be able to you know, really flourish and you know, kind of do the things that we do in the real world uh, in a digital framework. So I, I hope that makes sense, but I just feel that the foundation has to be solidified uh, before we really dive into the metaverse, because just like with any building, if the foundation is not solidified, uh, the building is prone to crash and you know really hurt a lot of people and waste a lot of time so i, I hope that uh, makes sense as the future of the metaverse and you know what are the fundamental building blocks that we need to get over there i think everyone definitely agrees about you know uh doing as much as we can to keep the human touch and human connection um but a human trust is is you know a whole other conversation and i think the technology that we have today somehow does help to build trust between entities that, that don't necessarily trust each other mm -hmm. uh, but let's not go there we know how how the world is um, but i love the point that you mentioned about the, the connection the trust and that truly decentralized world because we're really aiming for that right um how much experience we all have in it they're different right there's always space for improvement and i think we're though you you all are kind of early starters it's still a very short time uh, for such a technology, right? So I think there's still still a way to go and, and we can all uh, experience much more improvement. Um, anyone would like to go after ESCO? Is there anyone who would like to add something yeah. to, to um, the main? I'm sure I, I, I'm actually really excited to have John here because I used to use IMView quite a lot. So um, maybe we can make this a bit conversational. Um, but I think really the, the things that are very exciting about where the metaverse is headed is that, first of all, from the infrastructure, I think, you know, many important things like land indexing, land mapping, portaling mm -hmm. technology, protocols that will, you know, make all of that possible are incredibly important for this uh, market to evolve. Uh, but then from the consumer side, I think, you know, we've, uh, there's been a push for this uh, true ownership for a few years now with the blockchain virtual worlds. And I think what we're really, I think what the consumers are really hoping for is now that I have the ownership, how can I enable myself to do all kinds of exciting things, whether that's with builder tools, uh, further solutions, and of course, you know, in, in nature of the community-based businesses, how can we as a community of developers and, and 3D builders be a part of building these third-party marketplaces of add-on tools, et cetera? Yeah, I think uh, I think Batis is is singing our song um, in in, a, in kind of our virtual world, right? After eighteen years of having kind of in view in market, we we really haven't forced anything on our user base on this global user base, right? They've kind of found their 
the way into the experiences, the interactions, I'll say even the interactive validation with each other, right, uh, that works for them. Um, the core of our metaverse, a lot of metaverses, even when we hear about, you know, think Fortnite, very much a game, they talk about uh, the, the social aspects of the platform. So I think a, a little bit to the leading question, one key part for us is, this is all about, you know, kind of the, the, the interactions, I'll say, of humans, of, of each other in this metaverse is really important. Um, in some cases, you, you, um, our user, these global users want a third party to help keep things fair, honest, clean, make sure that the, the transaction went down. Other times they want us to stay out and just pay each other and other transaction things or self-validate with each other and enjoy each other's time in the metaverse. And sometimes they want to be out in the wild, right, off our platform. Um, we need to enable that. The way we see all this with the Web3 activity is the, the commerce part of this kind of enables a lot of this. We don't push it onto all of our users. A smaller percent of our users are actually engaged in, in the commerce side of this, if you will. But the Web3 really does enable it. And the one word that was shared here recently, the, the word of ownership is a huge shift in the space. All of a sudden, we've been selling millions of virtual items every day through our marketplace, our users have. But for the first time now, they can actually own those, resell those, gift them to a friend, take them off platform, relist them. We're talking with obviously with other virtual worlds and metaverses about potentially interoperability. So that true ownership is one key part of this. I'd say true, the true ability to earn is too, where for the first time they actually earn, in our case, maybe Vcoin or other crypto assets, those two, that's theirs, right? Um, as long as they earn that, honestly, that's theirs. They can take it off platform, turn it back into fiat, right? Do things with it. Those are, that's a real shift. And I think an important one for, you know, the metaverse gaming for all this online activity that users can have ownership and truly earn. So John, when are we, when are, oh, we sorry. Jobs? when are we leaving our jobs and, and going to do something to earn online? All of us. Maybe we do something online, but eventually we want to be, you know, inspired uh, on the beach or wherever everyone prefers um, yes. and doing what we best. Maybe it's not playing to earn, for example. I would not be a good gamer, but something else to earn. When do you think that is coming? As in, that's that's supposedly the moment of metaverse, right? Where we're all going to be, uh, or it's a moment in time rather than a place where our virtual assets that you were just mentioning that we can get swap and, and do other things. Um, the moment in time where those digital assets are going to be more valuable than our in real life assets. Mm -hmm. assets. When, mm -hmm. when do you think that's coming? Well, I don't know. It's interesting. You know, I think the, the first thing is people, users, people around, you know, global can already earn, right? Um, yeah. a lot, some of them have quit their jobs. Some of them, we literally, you know, they have, they've earned millions of dollars dollars of value over their time, um, mm -hmm. certain, you know, being a part of this ecosystem. Um, but, your, but to your kind of larger question, not, you know, not everybody is earning yet or not all earnings are happening in this ecosystem. It'll be interesting to see. I think um, certainly some, you know, global parts of the community will, will, you know, spend more and more, more time, right. An over indexed amount of time in the metaverse and earn more in the metaverse than they may in the other parts of the real world. Um, but I think others may, may, you know, I think there's still going to be a lot of human interaction that has to go down to, uh, uh, you know, in this real world, but there's no question more and more activities, even, you know, as we're here all kind of online, um, I mm -hmm. can see this, you know, next go around, we're maybe in metaverse form, right? Maybe we're in avatar form, maybe we're in rooms dancing around. Right. Um, and so I, I just think it'll continue to evolve, you know, um, and be, larger, larger part of our lives. I don't think it should take over our lives, just to be clear, right? Or we shouldn't stop with the human interaction by any reason, right? But I, I hope it gives us back, to, you know, the time to do whatever we point. prefer. That's, that's what I was going I and that. that's what I aspire. When I grow up, I hope this is how my life is. I do Fantastic. only what I love. Uh, Pauli, you- um, John. You oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask something. Go ahead. <laughs> You're next, Batis. So I, I was just saying that I agree that the uh, I think what truly pushes Metaverse to continue with strives with the technology and any aspect of that is the true ownership that we are talking about. Because as we know, um, even my, my project is being based on the premise that uh, we are all gamers in our, as the founders. And we were super frustrated that we spent countless hours 
we spend money on assets and by the time we are okay we're done with this game i have nothing left like this all this time money it's all gone it's in the ether right pun intended um, but if you look at what gamers really want is they want this assets to be theirs because it's theirs they, they spent time they found it they they crafted it forged it whatever however they they got it they got it very square even via looting i allow that in gaming but if you look at after the value when you close that device you have nothing so we wanted to change that we wanted to shift that so we the the way we're building our game is a, a hybrid of web 2 and web 3 so as a web 2 because we know that web 3 brings connotations that are immediately connected with FTX, all crashes and Bitcoin is bad, that therefore everything Web3 is, is it, you know, terrible, we should not touch it, we should be afraid of it. And we, we've noticed that um, via our community and how the waves are flowing is that every time there's any crash on Web3, anything with Bitcoin, crypto, Dodge, Elon Musk, whatever that happens, Web2 gaming, Web2 anything, uh, just regular pieces are just going, just, just, you know, going, building, everything's fine. And if you look at how we structure, started to restructure our business is we, we're creating a game that you can download just in a, you know, uh, on your app store or on your Android play store. I think I don't use Android that well, so I apologize. I only, I only test on it. And then, you can connect your assets to your wallet, whether you choose to actually take the next step to the Web3, to the metaverse, to so places that you might be not comfortable yet. But if you really want to own your assets, that's where you go. And that's what we're trying to achieve with not forcing Web3 on people or push them too early, but allowing them this transition. Because when they go to Discord and they say, hey, I have this weapon, I, can, I got it, it has... has you know, that, 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 that has this crystal, that crystal. And people are like, oh, I want this weapon. How much you want for it? Well, I minted NFT and you can buy it here. And people are like, whoa, 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 NFT, I'm terrified. It's like, well, you want the weapon or not? Fine, I want the weapon. Okay, this is the marketplace. This is my, my posting. You can, you can get it. So we're trying to give people options. And we know that if you are successful in Web 2, people from Web 2 will move to Web 3. And also Web 3 people will jump on more on that idea because they will be feeling like, ah, so they cross the chasm. It's not only for us, the niche community, it's for everybody. So now we are even more interested. So we're trying to do like a, you know, a, 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 like an infinity kind of loop. So people come from one set, from the other, and then they meet in the middle, in that golden middle that everything is possible for them. And I think what will push people more and more is that, need to own things because it's very hard nowadays to just say, oh, I own a piece of land because it's so expensive. I own this watch or I own this car because things, prices are going up. Recession is glooming and looming on us for the last few months. And people at least can own or have a feeling that this is mine and I can do whatever I want with it. No one's going to tell me that I can buy it, sell it, trade it. What well, is mine. So I think this will push ahead. But also one thing that I, I see is that it's still too hard for some people mentally to move into blockchain. It's such a hard term for them. Web3, it's such a scary term. And I think right now we are on what internet was in the 90s still. There's still not enough for, for everyone to be feeling comfortable to put www. And people are still waiting for this to be like, oh, yeah, blockchain, yeah, whatever. I, I have Bitcoin, I have this coin. Yeah, I know this. This is easy. People are still like, oh, internet, it's the devil. We should like not touch it. We should be scared of it. We're all going to die. So I think this will be, the, the transition will be when our parents will be comfortable to talk about it. And then we speaking to our kids, if people have kids here on this call, I have, to be comfortable talking about these things. And then once this, uh, this is reached, this goal, then I think will be, uh, pretty quick and swift move to the very much of a asset owned NFTs, assets owned and the de bigger development, more people will be comfortable with that. But also, also I want to say, I, sorry, I just last one thing. I also want to say that I don't want everyone just to quit their jobs and go to metaverse because I need someone to build the game and all the assets for us all to use and enjoy. <laughs> Please keep your jobs. We have some 10 years, maybe 20. I just wanted to say something real quick. Um, technically, I mean, metaverse, it all comes down to semantics. It's just a digital 
representation of ourselves. Technically, we are in a, some type of metaverse now, uh, controlled by Restream. You know, I guess this is the platform where our um, representations are. And uh, ultimately, it comes down to communities and, and utility. So the, the, we're, we're kind of empowering, you know, celebrities in South Korea, K-pop artists, uh, hip-hop artists in the U.S., because they already have a fan base and a community, and they are able to uh, engage and transact directly with their fans using proof of reception, uh, because prior they would need to, you know, only get a fraction of a penny, you know, from YouTube to share their videos. You know, they would only get a fraction of a uh, a penny from Spotify to stream their songs. So I think, you know, we need to kind of focus on the real world communities that exist, uh, you know, kind of help them to really connect directly um, rather than being controlled by these uh, centralized or third party uh, mechanisms. And uh, ultimately, um, you know, once we're able to, you know, provide some kind of value proposition, you know, more people will just naturally uh, come online, um, just like we're already online right now and speaking in a, in, in a digital framework. But I know Baptiste had some questions for John, so I'll hand it off to you, brother. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we started off talking more about jobs, right? And I think this is something that uh, we've, we've been thinking a lot about, um, especially because, I mean, in, if we go back to like 2004, um, there were people that were basically landowners in Second Life and other virtual worlds that mm -hmm. basically removed themselves from the real world and had basically full-time businesses running in there. Um, and in some cases, people even were representative uh, salespeople uh, inside of these worlds. And I think, I think that's definitely on the comeback. Um, it's just a question of how the execution will be and uh, how to enable it again in a, in, a, in a more expansive way. So what I wanted for the audience is to ask John about it because I know they've been thinking about this for plus 18 years as well. Yeah. Yeah. No. The the as you might imagine, the global community at Inview, or I think a lot of these metaverses, especially the ones that are more or virtual worlds, especially the ones that are more open, meaning you can kind of build out your own experiences and dynamics. I feel like you know, like nature, like they find a way. They self organize. They've created. You know, I'll just give you an example. There's you know two, two women in London that have created a virtual nightclub on our platform that they run. They've been for years paying the DJs like Esco and others to come in and perform the bouncers, the dancers, the bartenders um, uh, and other users, global users that come into that environment, you know, enjoy that kind of environment. And, you know, they make, you know, they either have been paid in the past in credits now in crypto assets that are, have real value um, and have created these environments. And I think the more, we put these these tools out there and kind of stand back as you know the platform operators if you will that's not a very cool way to say it but kind of the you know the people that put the foundation out there the more we stand back the community and communities will will kind of self-organize and create experiences and create the environments and create the rules at, at, at times in their environments and people will self-select to spend time in there and and, and maybe spend mm -hmm. money if you will in those environments and i feel like that's kind of how this space evolves and um, Polly had a great point too. And of course we've seen this in our environment because we had a metaverse business first and now we're web three. So when yeah. FTX goes down or Luna Terra happens or something, that, that doesn't affect our users. <laughs> I mean, those, those really that we don't have, a, they're not, you know, hardcore crypto traders in our environment, right. Who only came in to speculate on that new cool dress that was made by some, you know, designer. Um, they spend yeah. millions of dollars on virtual dresses and outfits and goods, but you guys know what I'm saying? They're not driven by that. Um, you know, they're more driven by their Friday paycheck they get or their, you know, stimulus check or something. You know, that that as far as e-commerce is involved, those things are more likely to drive them than, uh, you know, or inflation than, um, than some macro thing that we see in our, you know, Web3 world. But, you know, John, I as a as a person who is, you know, I'm starting to merge my journey from Web2 and Web3 and I'm trying to others awesome. as, like brands to to kind of take the first step. Yes, um, yes. I appreciate the stories of, you know, million dollar virtual dresses because it attracts the attention. And then sure. people who are curious enough, you know, they go and do a bit of research and they start understanding the basic, basic concepts and all that. So this is most probably, stories like that are most probably the reason why I am here. I'm not sure what brought you here into the space. That would have been a great 
first question to ask you, <laughs> but maybe we can take it offline because I think everyone has a great, great story to tell. But John, what you mentioned about a nightclub um, yeah. kind of uh, naturally goes into the, the next question that I have. And the question is about, um, is the, the metaverse world safe and fair? You mentioned bouncers. So we are already, already at the point where a nightclub in metaverse needs a bouncer. Why do you think that? What's with the human nature? Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you kind of two parts to that just because it's a little interesting in how the space has evolved. The first thing that it was used for is in view um, our platform we didn't have a way for a, a nightclub owner to charge entry fee. So they actually used bouncers to kick people out that hadn't paid the entry fee. So it was less about bad behavior, if you will, and more about, you know, you needed someone at the door kind of taking the cover, if you guys mm -hmm. know what I'm saying. Um, it has evolved, though, and, you know, anybody obviously in these environments. And this is where, you know, we talk about desiation, self -cut. That's where, like, I'll say those those folks i'll just pick on the nightclub running the nightclub you know they they do want a certain environment happening there right so um so they want to they'll create their rules there's other you know informal formal rules and some other you know environments rooms land on the platform mm -hmm. that could be more lax but you know they yeah they they might want to self-control that right i mean it's just like there's some you know environments in view where people are just sitting around discussing a hobby well they may not want people from the nightclub spilling into their room and doing things too. So, so yeah, it's, there's some of that. The way we think about it, honestly, is that there's a spectrum of environments that users, the community are going to want to engage with. Some are uh, more controlled and more safe. So on our platform, mm -hmm. if somebody rips off somebody else and it can be proved, our customer care team will help correct that problem on our platform. There's other environments where, Hey, you take your assets you've earned and owned off platform and you trade them with somebody and you're like, Oh, you know, somebody ran off with my, you know, they were going to help me build my room, but they didn't. They just took my virtual goods. You know, maybe we can't help you. You know, it's a little bit like the Wild West a little bit, right? There's everything. There's towns where there's there's sheriffs and they're there to help and create a certain environment. And then there's the Wild West you can go out into and you're on your own, you know, and choose where you want to spend your time. And it's totally cool and open, you know. Esco, I'm sure you have something to add about self-validation here in this context. I have, I, I feel it. My 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 protocol is yeah. connecting to yours, and Definitely. I can sense that you're not something. Yeah, please sure. share. I mean, um, I mean, the way that we look at um, self validation is we just you know we look at the biology biological functions that exist in our human anatomy. So, as I'm talking, you know, we all have our mental wallet or our database, right? That a as we confirm the word, I said hello. That hello in real time, you're validating with your sensory. Uh, mechanisms, and then you're storing that into your mind. So similarly, um, for us to, you know, really use proof of reception for self-validation and to make sure that, you know, there's no double spending, there's no uh, fraud, there's no security vulnerabilities, um, because we have this distributed ledger environment in Web3 with distributed ledger technology, for the first time, we can see each other's values in real time and mm -hmm. confirm that, you know, you have what you what you intend to give me. So with POR, it's simple where um, before we um, sign our proof of reception signature, we have the power to see each other's value. And then as John mentioned, we can create customizations for the value. Do we want that value to be revealing our identity? Do we want that value to be transacted for a certain amount of fiat? Do you want that value to be exchanged for data or some other uh, type of asset? And once that is self-validated by the counterparty, that is the only way that that value is transferred. So, you know, just like for us, you know, if we, you know, put something to cover our ears where we don't want to listen to you, you know, we're not going to listen to the, we're not going to have the reception of that value. Um, I think the idea here is, you know, just like John mentioned, we, we're here to create a tool set so that people can customize their preferences into the mm -hmm. transaction, uh, determine how they want to interact with one another, and then, um, you know, put the security measures there so that fraud and you know theft and all these things don't happen because once again until you receive the asset within the consensus mechanism we created um the transaction is not finalized so as you receive it that is when the transaction is uh, minted and recorded on the ledger if you don't receive it it just goes back to the status quo that existed before so we're just you know really uh people that you know value human 
interaction, and we're trying to make it as simple as possible to validate transactions. Uh, you know, saving costs for you know for John to run his network and you know have a lot of these functionalities. You know, it's very costly. But you know, what about for the rest of the world that wants to be involved? How do we include them? Uh, we need to figure out how to decentralize the computing power. You know, across our our devices and and figure out ways that we can use a digital construct to help you know the poorest of the poor uh, as long as the richest of the rich. And and to kind of conclude this thought, we've been used in the Ukrainian crisis so that Ukrainian refugees can self-validate the geolocation of where they're located. If they're in Eastern Ukraine, they can prove that with their phone. Uh, in mm -hmm. some cases, they have an NGO ID to prove that they're a unique uh, person in need to prove their refugee status. And once they prove that to a donor, the donor is able to self-validate uh, and, and receive those credentials and be more comfortable to send money to them directly yeah. rather than using the intermediary that traditionally takes 50% away from the, cap yeah. uh, the contribution of that donation. So as I said earlier, the more we find utility, the more that we empower communities, uh, the more you know, this digital paradigm you know, will flourish. But I hope that, that helped answer your question. It, you did, and I appreciate the example, you know, with that, the technology actually creating some very tangible uh, social impact. I think that gives us a lot of hope, you know, that um, going forward, hopefully all the admin fees that you, you mentioned. mentioned hope. Uh, ESCO is an acronym. It stands for every situation can offer hope. So I think that is the, that is the intent of all these things and not to be too cliche, but the more yeah. we are hopeful as a humanity, the more... Uh, you know, the brighter the future looks. So uh, thank you all for pointing that, yeah. yeah. Thanks, I mean, hope is, is fantastic. You know, you, we mentioned a lot of challenges and obstacles, uh, but what I really love about Pauli's uh, game and, and the environment that she's creating is that you're, Pauli, you're, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're teaching kids how to, how to behave in the future that is coming up and how to be, I will simplify it, how to be good. Am I right? Tell us yes. More about this part. <laughs> so, um, baseline so we concept. Make, we will not need bouncers in the future for the kids. No. That are yeah. <laughs> no, we, we, we're building a generation of kids that don't need bouncers because they know what is right and wrong. Um, yeah. What we are essentially trying to do is to introduce younger generation and also even this generation to a new concept of being rewarded for doing something good, resolving a situation, rather than killing someone and taking their stuff, which is the baseline on every game that we play now. Even Mario, you go, it's a very innocent game, but you go and you kill things to get coins, right? So that teaches kids, if I want something, all I have to do is to use a little bit of violence or kill someone and I get what I want, right? <laughs> it's baseline, so all grown-ups, uh, watching this uh, in the movies, in the cartoons, and it kind of stays with you in your subconscious mind that is very powerful, much more than the conscious mind. So we're creating this, you know, neural connectors in our brain to lead us through life based on self, uh, you know, um, what, what's, the, what's the expression? Rather than to take care of others and try to solve issues and problems and, and be amicable, right? Like ESCO wants to do. Everyone is like, oh, I will just, I want this. I'm just going to take it because I want it. I want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to help anyone. I'm just going to take it because I want it right now and I don't care for anyone else. So we uh, building the game that reward system will be based on helping, solving problems, doing something good. Yes, there will be conflict because there's nothing in the world without conflict and the conflict it will be sometimes solved with weapons, sometimes with diplomacy and different things. So magic will be involved. Of course, uh, no good RPG goes without magic, which we call Weka. It's the life energy that gives life to everything. And we have crystals, tons of weapons, and really, really um, beautiful, uh, you know, as you see, one of the... Um, environments that we have. It's the Mount of Azoria is just behind me. I don't know if you can see very well. So it's, it's a game that wants to give some more values. We teaching people about sacred geometry and that everything is connected, just bringing something different, but not like um, in your face, but through gentle mechanics of the game, 
through situations that you have to go through the quests. And you can also choose to be a really bad person. There is, we have two options. You can be following the light or you can follow the darkness too. You're just going to reach different conclusions of your game. So you can choose to be rewarded for good behavior or choose to find some different things in your path and maybe have more hardships because you're not choosing the right way. And you will always have a choice to go back to the good way. So it's, um, I can't wait to play and I can't wait to my kids to, uh, to give me the, uh, you know, thumbs up or down. They are very, um, let's say, honest about what we're doing. So we have a live audience in the house. I think you would uh, benefit the world with a partnership with Santa because you would make his job very easy. You would have a list of all the, the, the nice. I just, I, I just might write my letter to Santa tonight. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to put you on a nice list. Baptist, I have a question for you. Uh, Pauli mentioned a lot about, you know, the the game experience. I know you mentioned that on your platform you do um, you do treasure hunts, and then people get rewarded for that. How does it work? Because oh yeah, sure. So I mean, uh, treasure hunts are just part of many kind of like live marketing campaigns we do to uh, engage people uh, beyond just shopping. Uh, thing. I mean, what you would compare it to is maybe in commerce uh, platforms, there's been like Easter hunts or solving riddles or referral marketing campaigns. Uh, what we tried to do with uh, the first treasure hunt that we did a couple months ago with Polygon was um, to kind of like explore the different stores. And uh, it kind of led to a, a cool pivot idea where we were like, explore the, the history of commerce store experiences architecturally. <laughs> Uh, and that was really cool because it led to winning an artifact, uh, Nike NFT. Uh, people were really excited about it. Um, and there was some good learnings that came out of it, actually, which is that um, there's a second kind of thing that, in a way, is uh, a fun gamified commerce element um, where rather than exploring everywhere, um, it becomes kind of more like a, a slot game where uh, you... Uh, you basically, you, you get tickets or you use our space rocks. And uh, if you know those claw games, uh, you yeah. have like a direct we chance uh, each. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope to not make it too unfair, but basically that's the idea, I think, for the next time we do a bigger uh, treasure hunt and uh, marketing campaign. <laughs> awesome. Um, I have the last serious question to ask you before... I would love you to think about um, a question you can ask one of the other panelists. Please think about it. But before we, we do that, because we have only 15 minutes left, um, I would love you to share your predictions of the ecosystem, how it's going to be developing in the next five years. If you don't want to go into five years, maybe you can give us some hints on what do you think is going to happen in 2023? Because that's sure. around the corner. And how... Uh... how one can prepare you know, individuals, brands, what could they start doing and thinking about? Yeah, um, so I think about. part of, I think maybe part of my five-year predictions are that um, the, 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 the fundamental technical parts, protocols, et cetera, infrastructure for this 3D or spatial information highway will exist, that's for sure. Uh, people are already working on it now. Um, Adoption, I think we're right now at a very interesting like standstill where it's pretty clear that AR will supersede VR for like casual uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we will be better for very serious games and stuff like that, but AR will definitely supersede for casual and daily use cases in our real life. The question is just really, um, will the AR headset actually be able to achieve what we want in the next five years for mass consumption or will mixed reality kind of leap over that technology fast enough in the next five years? That's kind of something I've been thinking a lot about and concerned about talking also to the manufacturers and just playing devil's advocate. Um, I think other than that, um, I think we'll, if, if things continue at this pace of like uh, kind of like the, the aggressive nature we're seeing right now of metaverse companies pushing for getting brands and, and, and initiatives inside of virtual worlds, then possibly in the next five years, we will see 
uh, a major convergence to people having more of these 3D websites or 3D app presences um, rather than how we're consuming now. And I think AI will play a big role in, mm -hmm. in having created the convenience for that, at least from like a, a query and search aspect. Awesome. I would, uh, I'll ask you offline which devices you recommend to use, because I would love to, if you've done so much research, I, I need that info. Um, John, what do you think is going to happen in the near, near future? For sure. You know, I think the first part, this is probably just stating the obvious, is I think things will continue to evolve and move forward. Um, and part of that evolution, I think it'll be interesting to see the shakeout, I, I think, a little bit of all the metaverse plays or players around the space who um, might, some of them, I, I believe, will likely fall out if they don't kind of build out that inherent value, a reason to spend time in that environment. You know, it could be any any kind of, you know, reason that the communities want to engage. But uh, so because I think there's been a lot of environments that have been built out and frankly built a lot of created a lot of value, but users still aren't showing up much and that longer term becomes a problem. Right. So I think, um, you know, again, probably stating the obvious, but, but over the next three to five years, I think the evolution will start to favor those that have that inherent value, a reason for, you know, thousands, millions of users, co communities to show up, spend time, engage. Um, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see as we put these tools out there, kind of where these take us. I'll toss out one thing that I think will start to change and it'll take a little while for this current environment to kind of calm down. But we were seeing a little bit of a pattern. I think we'll see it kind of ramp up again of some of the large web two players start to want to work their way, if they can, into web three. Um, and I think that'll step up too. And some will fail, but it'll be interesting to see those that figure out and truly embrace, you know, the parts of the ethos here that we're talking about that are part of this web three, like ownership, right? Or letting users own and control more of the environment. But I think you'll see that too. And that, of course, that'll be a big ground shift. Um, when some of these big players kind of move okay. in. Amazing. I wish I asked you this question five years ago. I wonder what has it occurred. <laughs> I'm not sure. Pauli, <laughs> Pauli what do you think? I, I don't like to do predictions because that's really um, dangerous. <laughs> I but, we're live, you know everyone's gonna know. It's safe environment. Yes, I know. Okay, it's safe environment. Okay, okay. I, I will I will go with it. So I think my prediction is that, or maybe advice to companies to um, build a product that you want to use and you are not ashamed of it, that you are happy to say, I built this. Because if you are proud of your product, there's bigger possibility that the product that you're building is for your users because you're not building it for yourself. So always look if there's an actual need in the market for the product you're building, not because you just woke up one day, I want to build this. This is going to be great. Everybody wants, wants it. Do a research. Build things that people want to use. Like John said, right? Some projects will just shake off because users are not coming. There has to be a reason why people are not coming to my product. I'm spending tons of advertising. I'm bringing people. I have investments from big, big brands and people are still not coming. And user acquisition has to be seamless. It cannot be so hard that you have to beg people just show up and give them money. Please, I will give you 10 bucks. Just please come to the platform and just log in. This is not how you acquire users because your business will go out of business in no time. And we know this. So I think the what I think is that people start to slowly realize that building communities at grassroots, giving them reason to believe in the brand, building, making them feel that there is something in this idea, this ethos of your company that will be bringing, like, you know, align their thinking to yours. And they believe in that business and that, that feeling you give them, they, they have something they can attach to themselves and feel like, okay, I believe in this. I can actually put my time because spending time is equal to money, right? You give energy and this very limited resource that you own in your life is your energy. Time is very limited in a day, in a year, in your life. So you, you, people becoming more um, picky where they put their energy in, in, in nowadays. So we have to make sure that what we're building has some eternal values, not just like, oh, this is a cool product. Just come and buy it because I made it, right? We have to be more like, this is something that, we are happy to share with the community. We want community to enjoy it. We build it for community to enjoy. And if they like it, 
great. If no, we have to adjust it until they say, yeah, we love this. Keep going. We, we want more of this. And that's, I think, uh, companies need to structure their idea on instead of putting ego ahead, put community ahead because we all building products for everyone else, not for ourselves at the end of the day. So my prediction is everybody's going to listen to this advice and will build everything for community rather for their own ego. And I think it's a great idea to, to launch products that you would enjoy yourself. Makes a lot of sense. The only point that I would add to that from my uh, humble entrepreneurial experience, you said launch it when you're what, something that you're proud of. Just launch it before you're proud of it. You should be ashamed of it, but it should be live. <laughs> like, launch it, test like it. Fail, try again, but but do something, right? To to create something for the community, which Web3 is all about. Esco, the hope yeah, think, of the day. Uh, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, I, that, I think Baptiste was right. Um, we're we're going to see it more in AR. So here's an example of something that we did recently uh, for uh, Star Trek. I don't know if you can see it there. No, but we were able to, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. We're able to kind of bring the game to life, like right in front of you. Uh, we worked with mm -hmm. Paramount on that. Um, I think it's going to really be these content unique experiences and, you know, the e-commerce experiences that drive that in the early stage. Because, you know, these big conglomerates have the marketing budget, you know, to really kind of bring those uh, AR and XR experiences. And then um, I think we, re we really still need a lot of education and awareness around what the metaverse is. You know, a lot of people... I kind of think it's some abstract concept, but, you know, it's really something that can really help us, you know, in healthcare, you know, potentially, you know, caregivers can be able to go into your body and kind of use um, nanotechnology to, you know, kind of move and, and uh, cure, you know, different things within your body. Uh, we'll see kind of more of these kind of real world use cases come to life. And I think Pauly brought up a good point. You know, the fundamental asset for all of us is our time, right? So, I think, you know, the more that the metaverse and Web3 and and just uh, this entire industry in general creates less barriers to entry, you know, the more will be inclusive. So the fact that, you know, sometimes we need to, you know, have, have a token to participate in a metaverse. Unfortunately, yeah. that creates a limitation of the people that can be involved because first they need to have the fiat. They need to do KYC AML at an exchange. They need to be able to convert that. You need to ensure don't that the, scare the people don't scare the people. There's so many listening. No, no. So, so I, I believe in the next five years, we're going to make it simpler to come in with just your time. Right. Yeah. So if you can prove your time as an asset, you know, that can kind of give you entry into a metaverse. Or if you can prove your biometric or some unique identifier, you know, it will be a frictionless kind of experience where it'll be affordable. Even the companies running it, you know, will have the option to use proof of reception to, allow others to kind of self-validate their membership onto this community. Mm -hmm. And uh, first and foremost, I think it's the existing communities uh, that will drive the adoption of this because, you know, the metaverse is in one way or another, just a mirror image of what really happens in the real world. And I think it's the entertainment world, you know, with celebrities that have millions of fans that need to kind of wake up and say, hey, look, I'm just renting space from Instagram. I'm just renting space from TikTok. Why don't I create my own world and why don't I just empower my fans and the people that care about me uh, to validate this world versus giving away all of our data to a third party and that makes billions off of us. So it really kind of takes that fundamental step of education, awareness and, you know, just uh, opening our eyes to you know what happens behind the screen. And then once we realize, you know, those injustices of kind of digital exploitation by third parties, mm -hmm you know, us kind of um, figuring out, you know, how to free ourselves and, you know, free our time uh, to, to ultimately um, be digital natives. So that, that's kind of my thoughts in the, the future ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of empowering the artist, um, I just wanted to, to, that's obviously the story behind any NFT marketplace mm -hmm. and ours as well, where basically created um, to empower artists here in the Middle East, but clearly we're, we're going a little bit outside of the borders of ours and I really appreciate how you know all the stories here today actually they they were going all around that you know building trust rewarding each other for for what they deserve their behavior their values mm -hmm. and all that um, I think it's an amazing and I, thank you so much for everyone for sharing such valuable insights I think 
Uh, I would love to watch this again in a couple of years, like I said, and see you know if any of the predictions worked. We have a couple of minutes, five actually, but I wanted you to take the opportunity because I know you're you're the the brains that you have you're blowing my mind. So I know you're you probably have some questions to each other. Does anyone have one? Because I have questions to all of you, but we don't have enough time. I guess well, one thing lot. that it's oh, go ahead, please. No, no, I was going to ask Abdullah a lot. question. Maybe she can share kind of her take on the metaverse or how you see yeah, NFTs definitely. and I'll, Nifty I'll, Silk I'll, and others playing in our ways. We can, we're turn the tables on you here for a minute. Before, <laughs> the five minutes are yours. Please. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I kind of brought it up a little bit. I'm just, uh, it's everyone has their own opinion. I feel like when you're in, in an industry, you speak of metaverse from your own, own perspective, right? So fashion brands think, you know, metaverse is going to be this place where everyone worries about what people wear and they're going to come to us later to, to, to buy their digital assets. Or Pauli thinks it's going to be very gamified experience when everyone's going to be uh, naughty or nice. It's going to be their choice. For ESCO, it's going to be a place where everyone is talented and, or showcases the the biggest talents that they have. And for Batis, it's going to be a paradise for digital shoppers. <laughs> but for me, I feel like it's not really a place. I, I really think it's a time where I might have mentioned this. I'm not sure if it was on this call or the one I had before because I speak about it all day, every day. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the time, a time when our digital... Um, assets are going to be more valuable to us than the than the the physical ones right so my my dollar bill is going to do very little compared to the coin that i hold in my in my virtual wallet um and for this reason when i was given a title at nifty souk um it is pre-metaverse officer so it's basically we're not there yet so <laughs> in my personal opinion right and you can see how many challenges, how many hurdles we have in terms of adoption, in terms of user friendliness. We're speaking rocket science here for many, many people, but uh, there's so much to learn for all of us still, right? I, I'm sure you all agree about that. So yeah, I think it's gonna be a good place, a fun place. And hopefully, like I mentioned before, hopefully that moment in time is gonna free us from doing the things that we don't really enjoy, but we do it because that's how we create values for ourselves. That's how we transact. That's how we live, right? Let's not work to live. That's that's the place where I want to be. That's the metaverse that I imagine. So yeah, I think we have two more minutes. Um, I'm, I'm super happy about the, uh, the discussion today. I think it was uh, very interesting. We learned so much. And I really appreciate your time on very different time zones. Sorry for yes. waking you up this early, John. Um, okay. But yeah, someone's got to do it. <laughs> someone's got to wake I up. Think, I think that's a great yeah, that's a great summary, Allah. And, um, you know, it is the, the, the commonality we all have here is the time we spent, right? We were all in different places. We had different yeah. ideas, different identities. But the time is a common denominator. So um, uh, it makes a lot of sense for me. Yeah. I think if we would draw a little, you know, lines on the planet Earth where we are located right now, it would look very cool. Like you said, hello yeah, in in, cool. in New York. John, where are you? Are you on the West Coast? I'm in the West Coast today. So yes. Yeah. Wow. Early, it's early rise. It's dark here. It's early. Yeah. It's early. <laughs> early yes. We have two people, Pauli and Batis, in Europe, and and I'm here in the Middle East in Dubai. So yeah, there you go. We we covered all this Fantastic. the global conversation and I, I had a lot of fun i hope we all keep in touch after this okay. and yeah and i want to thank it's everyone for your proof of reception because we received so much value and self-validated one another and hope the audience um, also had a great time as well so thank you look forward to keep building sharing the hope. yeah as well sharing the hope thank you yeah. yes thank, thank you everyone here for for your time i think this was really great conversation and you. everything you guys are doing, it's truly amazing. And I'm hoping that, you know, if everyone has so much passion as us here, we can really make it really fun in five years. So fingers crossed. Very awesome. Sure. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay.
Pleasure to Take meet care, all guys. of you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.